Take a seat. <coughs> Good morning. Very warm welcome to you this morning, to Dale St. Andrews. Thank you for joining us. If you're visiting, we bid you a special welcome, and we also welcome those who are joining us online, either live or on catch-up later in the week. A couple of news items, just uh, to highlight stuff that's been on the screens or will be in your sheet as you arrived this morning. First of all, to say um, this afternoon is a messy church afternoon. Uh, I know that many of you have not been to messy church because it, it doesn't sort of fit in with what you are doing maybe as a family, but this is an event which is for young families, and we usually have about 100 to 120 people at this, kind of half and half adults and children, and we have a meal together, we worship together, we have crafts and games together, and it's been a real blessing over these last couple of years that we've had it. I'm very grateful to those who do so much hard work to put things together for crafts and games and for the food. So that's this afternoon. I'm mentioning it not because you can register, because it's pretty much too late. Although I dare say if you came along, then we would find a wee crumb of toast for you or something like that, maybe. Um, but so that you can pray for the ongoing success of Messy Church. This is part of our outreach to the community. And we have had quite a number of families who have no other contact with this congregation who come to Messy Church. So pray for them, if you will. And then, uh, just to highlight the men's club flyer, I'll get points with the men's club for doing this. Um, in three weeks' time, they've got their traditional Scots night, and that's on the 6th of February. The tickets are available at £6 from any of the members in the men's club. Uh, do go along, because I think it will be a great night. Moira Kerr and company is going to be providing some of the entertainment. And it's usually, uh, the tickets are usually very much in demand, and it's a great night. So if you can go along, please do so. You'll enjoy it. These are all the news items. Now, I don't know whether you pay much attention to our news sheet when you're coming in uh, week by week, but actually for probably about the last year now, the header on our news sheet has been a couple of verses from Scripture and also the footer. Um, too. And I'm going to use that couple of verses from Hebrews chapter 10 as our lead into worship this morning, because it reminds us of a couple of things that are really important. And since the new year, we've been thinking about what are God's priorities for us as individual Christians, as followers of Jesus, but also as a congregation a body of God's people. And this certainly calls us back to what ought always to be a priority. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Uh, some of that will be unpacked as we go on through our service this morning. Let's join our voices together in our opening hymn, which is actually a psalm. It's Psalm 84. Again, for 2017, we're singing our way through the psalms. We began on New Year's Day singing Psalm 1, and then last Sunday we sang the last psalm in the book, Psalm 150. And so we turn our attention this morning to Psalm 84, a great psalm of praise to God.
Uh, last Sunday, we sang Psalm 150 to a modern version, and this week we turned to a much more traditional tune as we sing Psalm 84. It doesn't get much more traditional than singing it from the Scottish Psalter. Let's turn our hearts to God and let's share now in prayer. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we praise you for the truth of that ancient psalm which we have just sung. For us, it paints a picture of how splendid is your presence, how benevolent are your ways, and how great is your power. And yet, exalted as you are, high above the heavens, you always offer a warm welcome to everyone, to the powerful and the weak, to the righteous and the sinner. We take heart from the image painted in that psalm of a baby bird finding refuge in your sacred house. And we know that you will not reject us nor condemn us as we approach you in faith and with penitence this morning. Heavenly Father, there is so much that we get wrong in this life. We confess that our words and our actions don't always flesh out in a positive way which we say we hold and the one we claim to follow. By your grace, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you will forgive us and restore us. Give us a fresh start at the beginning of another week with all its potential for good. A fresh start not only for us, but for others whom we serve in Christ's name. And help us not to be insular in the way we live our Christian life. Let us hear once more your call to engage with people around us in a positive way, to bring them a message of good news about Christ. And may that be in what we say and in what we do. May our lifestyle, our priorities, reflect the ultimate aim of building your kingdom and fulfilling your will and purpose. Almighty God, you have given us this day it is a precious gift. As we embark upon it with love and faith, worship and prayer, may you be pleased with the service we offer and the sacrifice of praise that we bring. Use all that we have and are to honor your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So we move from singing a pretty traditional psalm to a fairly modern song by Phil Lawson Johnson. Jesus is the name we honor. Sometimes I have to correct people, you know, just sometimes. They'll say things to me like, I'm coming to your church, Derek. And I'll say, it's no my church. It's Jesus' church. And that's what this song celebrates because Jesus is the name we honor.
Now, we have two Bible readings this morning, uh, two very brief Bible readings, just a few verses each, and one is from the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 28, right at the very end of that Gospel, and then one is a wee bit further into the New Testament, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians there in chapter 9. And our session clerk, Crawford Moffat, and our deputy session clerk, Helen Lawson, are going to come and share the readings with us this morning. Readings from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Our second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 to 23. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Amen, and may God add his blessing to these readings of his holy word. Thanks, Crawford and Helen. Thanks for that. We're going to sing God's praise again, this time in number 251 from the CH4, if you're following in a hymn book, and I know that just a few of you still do that rather than use the screens. And this is a great hymn because there's, there's a kind of two-way street in this hymn, if you like. It's almost like God is coming to us and asking us, calling us to do His bidding in the world, and the refrain, here I am, Lord, is it I, Lord, is our response to that.
bear with me for a moment with the tech. Lauren, will you put up that first slide for me, please? Well, you, not, the, uh, not that one. <laughs> the next one, sorry. Because this is not responding. My time's up. <laughs> Before I even begin. The second one. Brilliant. Thank you. That's grand. I think I may need you to flip them on for me and I'll just nod my head and you hit it. Is that okay? If I nod my head, you hit No, sorry. Forget it. It's... It's, it's okay. Right, if you weren't with us um, over the last couple of Sundays, or even particularly missed last Sunday, then you may have noticed from our news sheet this morning that there's a bit of a different graphic on the front of it. It's essentially about New Year's resolutions. And of course, this is the kind of time when people often resolve to do different things with their lives. Thank you, Colin, so much. Master Tech at work. Thank you. This is a time when people often do different things or resolve to do different things. Um, they resolve to maybe get fitter, healthier, wealthier, uh, to spend more time with their families, less time in work, a whole host of things that we mentioned last week. But last Sunday, from a scriptural point of view, from a Bible point of view, we looked together briefly at Isaiah 43 in which God says through the prophet, behold, I am doing a new thing. Don't you perceive it? And what we were hearing, I think, last Sunday was the call to be open to new things, uh, both as individuals and as a congregation to be open to new things. Now, I have to say that I commend this congregation for bearing with me in some of the new things that I've tried since I've come here as your minister 20 years ago, because we're in a very different place to where we were at that time, and you are an admirable congregation. But I said to somebody on the phone uh, during the week that you've got to keep moving. We are followers of Jesus, and if you're following, then that implies that you're moving, that you're not standing still. Because if you stand still, then you're losing track of things. We need to always be moving forward in our Christian lives and following where Christ leads us. So last week we did um, a couple of different things in the service. I had you all reading the Bible at the, the one time uh, this morning. I thought, well, Crawford and Helen would come up and do that. Helen was particularly keen to do that can see that by her face, can't you? <laughs> um, and we did a few different things last week, and we'll be doing a few different things this week. So, open to new things, and particularly to the emphases and the priorities that God has for us in our lives. What might those be? Well, the stage has been set this morning by um, the verses that we heard read you press the third slide, please, learn. <laughs> oh, there it is, there it is. Because in that scripture at the end of Matthew 28, what we have is Jesus spending some time very briefly with his closest friends just before he ascends to heaven. So the crucifixion is past, the resurrection is over, and this is what we call ascension before he's taken up to heaven, he gives the disciples a command, what has come to be called the Great Commission. And it's encapsulated in that one word on the screen just now, the word go. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Go, he says. Does he say wait? Or that people will come to us? He says, go. And then he adds a very personal promise. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. 
It's just a few weeks since we celebrated Christmas, and we were focusing on the birth of Jesus Christ, and one of the names that's given to him at that time is the name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So Jesus is the human face of God. He is the sign in flesh and blood that God is with us. And so Jesus underlined that promise that he would be with his people always to the very end of the age. Okay, so it's all nice and straightforward. Uh, we have to go and tell others. We have not for wait, to wait for them to come to us. And the Lord assures us that he will be with us, give us his help, to put into practice what he asks of us. Easy peasy. This evangelism thing, this outreach, this sharing our faith couldn't be simpler. Couldn't be more straightforward. Is that right? If that were the case, then I guess that churches everywhere would be full and overflowing. Because as soon as you shared your story, people would say, that's amazing. I'm going to go with them and worship Jesus and join the church. Maybe it's not just so easy. What's the problem? Well, actually, the problem's you and me. A lot of the time, the problem's you and me. A recent survey showed that almost 80% of non-church people said they were not unhappy hearing from their Christian friends about their own faith. However, a parallel survey discovered that up to 80% of Christians felt unsure of how to share their faith with their non-church friends. So actually, there's a bit of a disparity here. There's lots of people out there who are not really part of any church who go to Asda or Aldi or the golf course or wherever on a Sunday morning when we come here, and more of them are keen to hear and happy to listen to things about the Christian faith than we who claim to have that faith are willing to share. So we feel quite vulnerable. We feel quite uncertain. So I want to this morning with you hit the pause button for a moment and mind that gap and see if we can plug it. See if we can put something useful into that gap between the real willingness of some people to listen and our sometimes reluctance to speak. How do we take those opportunities? Okie dokie. And that's where my wee clock comes in. Some of you who are Countdown fans will recognize that. I hope we're not going to get sued for copyright. A bit like last week if you were here, I want you to spend a few moments chatting with those around you. This week the focus is a wee bit different. I want you to share with the two or three people around you, and please remember, don't leave anybody out, okay? Make sure everybody is involved as far as possible, as far as they want to be involved. I want you to briefly say to those around you, who was it that first introduced you to the Christian faith and to church? Who brought you to church? How did you come to faith in Christ? You've got a few minutes, and when I think that you've had long enough, I will hit the clock. Go for it.
Shia. Okay, so I know it's a novelty. That's two Sundays in a row you've been given permission by the minister to talk in church. <clears throat> okay, um, like last week, um, that's a very personal thing, sharing with those around you, and some people feel more comfortable than others sharing publicly, so I'm not going to get you to do that. I'm going to suggest to you, well, I hope it's an educated guess. I don't know whether it's a hypothesis or an educated guess, that most of you I would guess, were brought in the first instance by somebody you already knew. And that category would probably be filled by maybe a parent or a grandparent or another relative that you were close to, maybe even a friend, a neighbor, a work colleague, somebody like that. I'd be interested to know, just give me a, just give me a quick indication, stick your hand up if that was the case. Wow, yeah, that must be about 90%. Okay. But some of you maybe came to faith and into church as a result of a kind of formal outreach, something like summer mission or youth with a mission, faith mission, scripture union, Billy Graham, Louis Palau crusades, that kind of thing. It may well be that it's been an event. But my educated guess about that is it was probably somebody that you knew who invited you to go along to that event. And that might have again been a family member or it may have been a close friend or a colleague, somebody like that. Did some folk come into that category? A few, okay. It doesn't matter in a sense how you came to that place of faith. It's the fact that you're there that's important. But I'm pretty sure that as you were talking about your own experience, that you maybe started to see the importance of the personal touch and of personal 
invitation. If we're going to reach new people for Christ, then personal invitation is hugely important. And the answer that I usually get to that then is people say, I don't know what to say. What have you just been doing? You've just been sharing your story with two or three people around you. You might not think much of that story. It might be something that's very ordinary for you, but it's your story. And that was the title that I gave to this slot today, I Want to Tell You a Story. Those of you who are old enough will be expecting me to break into song now because that was a, a phrase that was associated by the late, great Max Bygraves. I want to tell you a story. <laughs> That's about as good as my impersonations get. Sorry, folks. You have a story. I have a story. We all have a story to tell of why faith is important to us and how we came to that faith and why we're part of this lovely church of Jesus Christ. That's your starting point. Okay, but we have a second passage of Scripture this morning. We didn't just look at Matthew 28, where Jesus said, Go! We heard these words read from verse 22 of 1 Corinthians 9. I have become all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. For those under the law, I became like one under the law. For those who are weak, I became weak. All of that good stuff is there. It makes it sound as if Paul was a wee bit of... I'm going to have to get a hammer for this, I think, Colin. Do you press the next one? Please? Thanks, Lauren. It makes it sound as if Paul was a wee bit of a chameleon character, as if he changed, as if he shifted in his position. Didn't shift his position, didn't shift his beliefs, didn't shift his faith, none of that. But he thought seriously about the people that he was with at that particular time. So he knew that people's context was different. He knew that if he was speaking to Greeks who were into philosophy, that he would have to take a very different tack than if he was speaking to his fellow Jews who were schooled in the Scriptures. And so similarly, we have to start to be strategic as Christians. We have to think seriously about who we engage with in our daily lives, who are the people we share our time with each day, and how we do that intentionally as believers. So again, I want you to take some moments to share with those around you. Again, the clock will be on you in just a moment or two. And I want you to speak with others about the folk that you share your life with. It might be family, it might be friends, it might be work colleagues. And I want you to start in your minds to make a mental list, maybe just even three people only, that you would like to see come to faith and be part of, if not this church, then the church of Jesus Christ, wherever it meets. What do you have in common with those people? Think about that. Is there a touching point from your own experience? Guys, don't just talk about sport, all right? And sorry to be kind of sexist in that, those of you who are female and who go to Fir Park, the rest of you, I'm not, not concerned about the rest of you, just the ones that go to Fir Park. <laughs> um, don't just talk about sport, but think about what are the touching places? What are the ways in which in your everyday life you would find a context in conversation with someone to share a wee bit about your faith? And then make a list of the people that you want to pray for and gently and graciously witness to. Go for it. 
You've got another few minutes, and then the clock will start. Oh, it's just as she hit the it's just as she hit the floor. not get your anagram worked out by this time, then you <laughs> make a little list. Yeah. Gilbert and Sullivan, make a little list. I want you to not just have chatted about people in your family, your friends, in your street, at work, whatever it is, and, and then walk out the door and forget about that. I want those people to be the focus of your prayers and also for you to take those opportunities, not forced opportunities, but real natural opportunities when they arise to be able to share your story. Because remember, you have a, you have a story. You have a story. You might not think it's spectacular, but you have a story. You have a faith. Are you going to be here? Let's face it, there's lots of other things you could be doing on a Sunday morning. And so, if someone in your family or friends or whomever took the time to share their story and their faith with you in word and action, and you are here because of that, it's your turn. It's your turn to pray for someone else and to witness to them as well. And do you know what it's about? Lord, it's about relationships. It's about sharing friendship, evangelism. And because as you become friends with people, as you become friendly towards them, as you are there for them, they're much more likely to listen to your story. And the person you are and the faith you have will rub off on them, because that's what I guess happened with many of you. So, 
we're not setting resolutions, but we're looking for a revolution. A revolution is a turning around. It's a change. Change in us so that there might be a change in others. Use those names to pray. Use those opportunities to share. And let's, let's see how God honors that. Because He will. He will. He promises to be with us. Now, before we draw this section just to a close, I want us to take a moment to thank God for um, the people that we were mentioning earlier on who helped us to a place of faith. And I want us to pray for those that we would love to help to a place of faith as well. There we are. We are at the center of a lot of relationships that we almost take for granted every day. But they're all opportunities to share our faith. As is every time we bow the knee before the Lord and we pray. Pray and pray and go on praying because it makes a difference. Let's just pause for a moment's quietness now. We've had a lot of interact, of fun with this, and it's important. But let's just pause for a moment just quietly and we'll share in the prayer. Lord, this whole area of being public about our faith outside of this building is one we find challenging. Yet we cannot avoid the truth that unless we pass on what we believe and see others drawn to you, the church will die. Help us then gently and graciously, but with integrity and faithfulness, to hear and answer your call to be witnesses. We do think of those near and dear to us who are as yet not actively connected to Christ. Just as we are so blessed to know you as our Father in heaven, we would want that experience also for all whom we love. So hear our prayer. And now we bring our offerings to the Lord for His work in the church and the world. The offering will be uplifted.
Let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, it is an honor to look back upon our lives and to identify those who have had such a positive influence on us. What a responsibility it is for us now to undertake that same role in the lives of others. And so, as we ask you to receive these offerings, we pray that they will be a sign to you of our thankfulness for the past, coupled with a commitment towards the future. The world in which we live and move and have our being is surely one that could benefit from people who are seen to be positive role models, those who give themselves in service of other people and make a difference. Prayerfully then, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be at work in our hearts to make the changes that are necessary in us to bring us to a place where we can be of more practical use to you in bringing the message of freedom to everyone. We pray for those who wallow in a slough of selfishness, who can't see their own desperate need because they're too focused on their wants and their desires. And we pray that you will humble them, Lord. We pray for those who think way too highly of themselves, expecting that others will simply kowtow to their way and command. We pray that you'll humble them, Lord. And in contrast, we pray for people who feel of little consequence, those who have a complex about being unimportant and inferior, maybe even too sinful to be a follower of Jesus. We pray that you'll raise them up, Lord, and bring them to a knowledge of yourself. Through a simple word of encouragement or an act of faith, use all that we bring to you to bring others to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, the children should be waiting outside that door, eager to come in and tell us about their story this week, so we look forward to welcoming them. Trumpets, go on, blow your trumpets. No job. What a racket! My goodness. Well, you guys have obviously had a great time at Sunday school and Fusion Bible class this morning. Brilliant. Well done. Lord, I'm going to have to ask you to help me. Will you put up the first slide for the youngsters, please? Brilliant. Okay, so we know we were starting to talk about Gideon last week, and we discovered that lots of small changes had to take place in Gideon for God to use him in an incredible and a mighty way, didn't we? And those of you who were here, I think that you thought that I was going off my rocker because I was going in and out here. Somebody said to me uh, last week, when I came back in for the third time, when you went out, I was just hoping that you'd have it on under that shirt. <laughs> Those who weren't here, I was divesting myself of my clothes last week, and the children were spotting the changes. But they didn't spot it when I changed my hairstyle. Imagine that. That was crazy, wasn't it, boys and girls? Later in the day, 
Later in the day, my grandson said to me, Pops, you've got no hair. <laughs> so he's, he's right up there, isn't he? Okay. So I talk about Gideon, who was an unlikely hero. He was someone who was from a very quiet family, a farming background. You wouldn't have thought of him as being somebody that became a fighter. He also had another name, which is here on here, if Lauren presses the button, called Jeroboam. And that was because he was able, along with others, to destroy some of the idols that people worshipped. The enemies of God were worshipping idols. But you're going to tell me a wee bit about what you've learned in the story today, and then see if I've got pictures to match it. So, what was happening with Gideon in the part of the story you were thinking about today, Adam? And the bad guys were having a battle. The bad guys were having a battle. I think I've got that up there. You got a slide for us, Lauren? There you go. The bad guys were having a battle. Yes. Does anybody know what the bad guys were called? It's a big word. Starts with mmm. Do you know, Emma? Enemy. The enemies. That's right. Yes. That's well. Yep. My 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 family always say. Why use a wee word when a big word will do? But Emma just gave me a wee word. That's fine. They were the enemies of God's people. That's right. But they had a name for their particular Um, nation. Can you remember? You can't remember. Can you remember? Go on then. The Midianites. Well done. The Midianites. Yeah. I suppose you could say that one way to remember what they were called is that they were people of the darkness. People who are opposed to God's ways are always people of the darkness. So I think, when is it darker than at midnight, right? So if you think midnight, it's dark. They were the enemies of God's people, and so they were called not the Midnights, but the Midianites. And so how did Gideon manage to defeat them? What can you tell me about that? What can you tell me, you? Um, that was the, because they dropped um, drugs and they waved fire and they, sh- and they shouted. Uh-huh, go on. Do you know what they shouted? Yeah. Go on, tell me. Can you remember? Sword to the Lord and to Gideon. Well done, that's right, yes. They had a jar with a torch and a trumpet. And in one hand, they held the jar with the torch, and in the other hand, they held the trumpet. And they came down the hill into the camp where the Midianites were, and they shouted, they broke the jars, the torches shone very brightly, and they sounded through their trumpets. Right, let's hear some of you sound through your trumpets, because some of you have got trumpets. Where are all the ones with trumpets? Where are they? They're at the back here. Right, okay. Okay. Let's hear you. Blow your trumpet. Well done, Luke. Well done. Well done, Samuel. Can't get to the rest of you. You're all blowing your trumpets. Well done. Didn't work. Total waste of time. So they smashed the jar. They shone the light. They blew the trumpets. And the enemy all ran away because they were so frightened. Were you going to add something in, Abigail? They were fight. They were what? They were fighting each other. They did fight a wee bit, but a lot of them ran away because they were so frightened. The bad guys fighted the bad guys. The bad guys were fighting the good guys. Yeah, it's a bit like Cowboy and Indian movie, this, isn't it? Adam, what were you going to add? When the good guys won, um, um, the good guys were confused and they fighted each other. That's right. The bad guys were confused and the good guys won the battle. Now, who would have thought that somebody like Gideon, who came from a farming background, not very strong in himself, would be able to lead others in going into battle? But that was because, boys and girls, he depended upon God. And God it was who gave them the victory. So, an amazing story. I think I maybe did I have another slide? I'm trying to remember, Lord. Is there another one? Was that the last one? Yeah, there it is there. I thought I had another one. 
That was what they shouted. That was what Ewan was telling us. They shouted a sword for the Lord, the Lord being God, and for Gideon. And they went into battle, and they won the battle. So what are we to learn from that story this week, boys and girls? Well, I'll tell you, very simple. That sometimes when you don't feel very strong in yourself, and you don't think you can do something yourself, when you depend on God, and God leads you and guides you, He gives you the strength to get through that thing that's really difficult, really hard, really challenging for you. Then we're going to say a prayer together, and then we're going to sing a song to finish our story. Thank you for bringing your trumpets today. That was brilliant, really good, and I hope you enjoyed that story about Gideon. Fantastic. Right, let's pray together, shall we? Father God, we thank you for these children in our church family, and we thank you for all that they're learning, particularly about Gideon, learning just as he trusted you, that we can trust you, and you won't let us down just as you didn't let him down. Be with the boys and girls in whatever they're doing this week, whether they be at nursery or at school, just be with them, Lord, and help them to know your strength and your joy in their lives. Uphold them and surround them with your love, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we're going to sing a song together to finish, and I hope that you're going to join in doing this, all the young folk as well. It's a great song of praise, and it's a good message to remind the adults of what we've been talking about today. It's about letting our light shine and sharing with others the love and the faith that we have for in Jesus shine.
The old song says, go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and far away. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so, having received God's forgiveness, share it. Having been brought close to Christ by His love, show it to others. Having been blessed by the Spirit of God, be a blessing now and always.